It is called Deadly Bedding. Please welcome the fantastic Melanie Chardoff. Thank you. It was tough enough sleeping alone for a sensitive person like me. I would wake freaked out to find my ear bent over and aching, my hips and knees dislocated during the night from splaying, and find facial scars, drool, and eye flu fluids crusted into my skin. Sometimes in the wee wee hours of the night, this princess and her pea would stumble onto what once were feet, shocked to find that they'd become painful stumps. Are these my real feet, I'd ask the air. Did someone switch them in the night? And then I'd be awake till dawn with all possibility of rest slipping away. Because I'd lived so long on my own, I slept lightly, primed to react to stray sounds in the big cities and close quarters I preferred. Discerning the sounds of a neighbor doing normal things from a beheading in progress was a survival skill. <laughs> One eye stayed open, keeping a vigil while the other did its rims, and then they would switch. <laughs> I would awake wall-eyed and exhausted. Then when an allergist told me that I was breathing in mites and fungi from my bedding, that was the last straw. <laughs> and the last down on which I ever happily slept. The dangers during the hours meant to be cozy and restorative undermined any sense of security in the world. Was there no sanctuary for the informed? <laughs> With the benefit of the internet, I learned coping mechanisms to protect myself, throwing my toxic quilts and pillows into the dryer on high heat 30 minutes a week to kill all the creatures and suck out all their corpses. <laughs> I bought foam wedges to hold my body firm against the onslaught of its own gravity. I gauged how many ounces of water I could drink for how many hours of sleep. Four ounces, I would awake at 2 a.m. Two ounces, I could maybe make it till 5 a.m. But if I drank no water at all, I would wake up swollen and tongue like dead cattle during the dust bowl. It was a constant, constant balancing act. <laughs> Sippy cups, tempur pillows, lavender eye masks, knee dividers. There were worlds of merchandise seducing from me the money that I hid under my hypoallergenic latex extra firm mattress. <laughs> I was just getting the hang of sleeping alone when I met handsome Stan. Mm -hmm. Smart, funny, and adoring father, a doting doll of a nice Jewish PhD. <laughs> and from our first dinners out, he was slipping the most delicious bits of his fish to me, the nicest slice of his cake. Clearly, he liked me too. Soon, our waking hours were not enough to contain our enthusiasm for one another. We wanted more. It was time to discuss taking the next step, sleeping together. Oh, no, not to have sex, no. <laughs> Just sleeping together. <laughs> we got to first base by accident one day, collapsing in an afternoon nap. I'd been beside myself lately whenever he wasn't beside me, so waking up to find him there smiling next to me felt so right. I'm shy, I said, about moving too fast. Me too, but our being together feels inevitable. I sleep in baggy cotton stuff, I said. So do I, he exclaimed. I'm a pillow-holic, I giggled. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, he cried, I have six. <laughs> I like him soft, I said. I like him hard, he said. <laughs> I'm a morning person. I'm a night kind of guy. I'm a very light sleeper. I snore, he said. <laughs> I have earplugs, I said. I have a sleep apnea machine. <laughs> No, no, 
oh, we cried. How could such daytime complementarity coexist with such nighttime incompatibility? We had too much going for us, but we needed to explore this. For two insomnia folks, spending the night together would be our Everest. <laughs> we embarked on the climb equipped with the coziest of t-shirts and shorts with 2,000 thread count pillow covers and sheets and crept onto his wall-to-wall -wall extra firm California king. We were too thrilled to sleep those first few nights. And we had lots of adjusting to do in the cuddle phase. Living alone so long, I hadn't realized how bony I had become. <laughs> my ribs were unable to tolerate his arm. My neck was unable to tolerate his shoulder for more than a minute. My arm on his chest inhibited his rest. My leg over his made him claustrophobic. <laughs> So we put pillows in the problem spots, paid patience in the learning curve. The third night, delirious with lack of sleep, I earplugged and blindfolded myself into sensory deprivation. <laughs> As he read in the prison floodlight, he had illuminating his <laughs> But I started to find I felt safe with him keeping watch by my side. I could actually sleep keeping both eyes closed. What a relief! Until he turned off the light, and then his loud breathing degenerated into multisyllabic snores punctuated with desperate snorts of near suffocation <laughs> that pierced my earplugs through and through. But far from irked, my protective heart felt like it had to keep a vigil so he wouldn't die. <laughs> this is how I knew I cared. <laughs> I discovered that if I made successive little kissing sounds, I could interrupt his snore sequencing and I could fall into a little sleep. So we awoke the next morning to debrief. Boy, boy do you snore, I said. Well, you make these weird little sucking noises. <laughs> so one week in, my affections expanded. I had synchronized sleeping with his quiet, waking every few minutes with his noise. Twenty weeks would have to suffice. I would catnap during the day. And as his fondness grew, he became afraid to disturb or actually kill me with his restless leg kicks and twitches and lurches, and he'd creep away to his couch to leave me in peace. But I would miss him, and I would crawl out of bed to kiss him. Like an O. Henry's gift of the Magi, what we gave up for love was sacrifice our precious sleep patterns. <laughs> Infatuation crowded out, need for rest as lust came creeping, and sex came leaping, and came and came and came again. Living together was the next logical step. Within a year, he had given up his sprawling king for the little old queen in my little old house. Like new parents giving birth to our baby love, nursing its newness, we knew we might never sleep the night again. <laughs> but with no risk of pregnancy, no critics of our middle-aged good fortune, sleep was our little dragon to slay, our romantic gauntlet to run. At first, it got much harder as he grew more comfortable in my home. The sweetest man by day, by night, Stan was a sociopath. <laughs> Gentle Dr. Jekyll would hide nocturnal Mr. Hyde until drowsing into bed at two. He would headbutt me unconscious in his try at a goodnight kiss. He would clap my eardrums to near bursting in his attempt to clasp my face to his or kiss my eyeball widened in panic. <laughs> Sometimes he would toss his six pillows aside and pull mine out from under my head and my head would thud onto the two front mattress. He would be a human paper clip slipping between the quilt and the top sheet instead of under the sheet and quilt together, dead weight with his arms on top of the quilt. And pinned in, I'd be unable to extricate my arms lest I wake him, which I'd hate to do because insomnia would start all over again. 
I learned to lie immobilized like a mummy in a tomb, gazing at him by the glare of his digital clock as it shouted out my sleepless hours. <laughs> Beneath his beatific face, I see tsunamis, cyclones, and zombies arise. He jerks, he jabs, he writhes and fights, in which I must intervene before he loses some big psychic battle. Oh, it's a rodeo some night, as I'll roll him bucking onto his side, and I'll pin down his legs. You see, in fetal position, the friction in his subconscious and his sinuses seems to subside. And we're in dreamland until the violent bed quakes as he seeks his phone alarm buried in my sheets or bed cavities, or body cavities. <laughs> to ease the concern in your faces, dear friends, I must tell you there are many compensations. He tucks me in at 12 with a bonus back rub, so I sleep double deep till his shift starts. <laughs> <laughs> And then the smell of his head becomes my sedative, his body the womb from which I wish I had been born. I get up early so he gets some hours to abuse the pillows alone. <laughs> Most of which end up on the floor several feet from the bed. We deploy herbs, medications, meditations, and forgiveness, and it's getting better all the time. Now that I make him meals, slipping him grains instead of glutens, goat dairy in place of cow, his labored breathing is easing. And although he denies that diet is the cause, the Hannibal Lecter machine is now in storage. <laughs> and I must admit with some pride, even unconscious, he is so talented. His animal impersonations are astounding. <laughs> Trumpeting elephants, growling tigers, hidden kittens. He can whistle for a New York cab with his nostrils stuffed up. His, his coughs could open in La Boheme at the Met. <coughs> I love to touch his sleeping hand and have it clamp onto mine like a Venus flytrap. <laughs> until it's nearly gangrenous from the pressure. <laughs> and the way he reaches for me each morning, making out with a pillow till he locates me amongst the covers. <laughs> Seven months married, I awake amazed at the creature comfort of forming the matrix of our lives. My free-floating anxiety sinks in his ocean of devotion. There's nothing that can warm my feet like his, my hands like his, my heart like his. Ours is a love for which it's Ours is a love for which it's worth losing sleep. Thank you. Thank you.